Welcome to the Interwilderness Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Byron Pace. It is the 6th of February, 2020. And oh man, do we have a treat for you today. This is an incredible podcast that we recorded at the start of last year when we were in Montana with a gentleman by the name of Ben O. Williams, known locally as the master of upland bird hunting in Montana. Uh, Also in this podcast is my brother, Daryl, and the editor-in-chief of Modern Huntsman, Tyler Sharp. Uh, And we, the four of us, had this amazing conversation over the space of like an hour and 40 minutes where we got to find out about Ben's life and the things that he's been involved in. It's a very leisurely paced, fascinating podcast. So I suggest you pour yourself a whiskey or maybe a brandy. And if you're not into alcoholic beverages, maybe a cup of tea and put your feet up beside the fire and just enjoy Ben talking about his life story. Uh, It starts um, with him fishing in Scotland, which I wasn't expecting at all, which is, of course, where I live. Uh, and we've found out about his fascination and love of fish. But we go on to talk about sage grouse and sage grouse habitat, his role in legislative change uh, for environmental protection in Montana, what he has done and achieved as a writer, um, setting up uh, the Trout Unlimited chapter in Montana, as well as the role that he played in helping secure the Metcalf Wilderness Area. And there's a whole heap of things that I haven't mentioned there. It's uh, it's an incredible podcast, and I'm very excited to be able to bring this to every single one of our listeners. But before we get there, I've got a couple of other things I've got to say. First up, thank you very much to every single one of our Patreon supporters. And the top tier supporters for this month are Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of rdcontracting.co.uk, Chris Griffith, John Henry Pete, Tom McCraith, James Benjamin Normandale, and James Marchington. But thank you very much to every single one of you, even if you're not a top tier supporter. If you would like to support the show, go over to patreon.com forward slash Pace Brothers. Our friends at the Northern Shooting Show have just launched an amazing initiative called the passport to shooting which is to help encourage young people into the um, hunting and shooting community so they've launched it at the northern shooting show which is on the 8th and 9th of may 2020 at the yorkshire event ground it costs only five pounds it's for under 16s and it means that you can go there pay your five pounds get some clay line coaching Get an air gun experience, a simulator session, and a game prep demo. What an amazing sort of oversight into the possibilities. And I hope that it's going to encourage a lot of youngsters to, to come along and see what it's all about. We have a winner from our guest, the sound competition t- from two weeks ago. There was a lot of wrong answers for this sound. It was indeed a hippo. So congratulations to everyone who got that right. Um, it wasn't uh, a caribou or a red deer or a barking mouse, or anything like that. We had some very really, very weird um, suggestions for this one. Uh, but a number of people got it right, so congratulations. And the winner, uh, randomly selected from those correct entries, uh, is Glenn Milne 89 on Instagram. So congratulations, Glenn Milne. Uh, you are the winner. Get in contact with us to give us your details, and we will get a copy of Volume 4, Modern Huntsman out to you. Of course, Modern Huntsman are our supporters, friends, colleagues, and allies in this podcast. You're going to be hearing from the editor-in-chief, and indeed, as I mentioned, Tyler Sharp, in this very podcast. Uh, I have a phone call with him in one hour to discuss the next volume of Modern Huntsman, which is uh, going to be looking at the culture of hunting around the world. So it's very exciting, and we're slowly getting that together. If you haven't got your hands on any of the first four volumes of Modern Huntsman, and you enjoy this podcast, it is absolutely essential reading. So head over to the Modern Huntsman website and you can find all the details from ordering your copy. But we're going to give you the chance to win a copy right now, as we do every two weeks, with another guest, The Sound. So have a listen very carefully to this and then get in contact with us and tell us 
what makes this sound, and in two weeks' time, we will announce the winner. So you can contact us uh, via social media, Instagram, which is Pace underscore Brothers. We're Pace Brothers on Facebook, or you can email the show podcast at paceproductionsuk.com, and I save all the winners over the two weeks and then randomly select somebody with the correct answer. So I think with all that said, uh, I won't hold you up any further, and now you're going to get to hear this amazing interview with Ben O'Williams. Ben, thank you for welcoming us into your home. You were telling us just before we started recording about uh, fishing the Tay, and I'd like our listeners to hear that story because you said it was 20 or 30 years ago. And the numbers of fish that you were catching, I think, is going to make people quite depressed today, <laughs> considering the state of the river. So just t- tell me that story again about where you were fishing sure. on Isle of Mouth. I don't, um, um, I don't know which year it was, and I don't recall, but we, we uh, had a th- three-day... Uh, on the Tay, a beat, um, and uh, and we stayed at a lodge not very far from there, very very close to there. And uh, the first day, I think I caught six uh, Atlantic salmon, and I totally over the three days, I think I caught, I can't remember quite, I think at least sixteen. And that's the, a whole season for most right, people. <laughs> the first, and and they they had a, he, uh, I don't know what uh, you call it, uh, but it was a wooden boat, a very large, a very large wooden boat. We'd go out into right where the the aisle mouth comes in, and those Atlantic sandwich would stack up there. And I think I don't think I. I don't think I was there 50 minutes, and I hooked into a big, uh, a big fish. I think it was probably 20 some pounds or something like that. And I've, I fought the fish, and I, and the, uh, and the gilly pulled it up, and <laughs> and I yelled at him. I said, "Release the fish! Release the fish!" And he whacked it on the head. <laughs> I said, oh, I said, we're not going to do that again. I said, I don't want to kill these fish. I just want to release them. <laughs> okay. And, and the ghillie said, well, he, he wasn't too sure about that. He didn't think I should do that. But it's funny how uh, you're, times have changed. You're ahead of your time. You're well ahead release. of your time. Yeah. Because now, now, you know, especially yeah. in Scotland with salmon, almost it's yeah. almost all catch and release. Yeah. But so, why, why did you feel like that? Why did you want to put the fish back? Because it wasn't common, like at that period of time, as your experience oh, was. Because in Montana, ever since I've been here in in the '60s, we release fish. We don't. We don't. I have. I have never killed a fish out of the Yellowstone River. I just don't do that. Um, so we release them, and, and in fact, even with a, even with the hooks, I like a a barbless hook, um, and the hooks I used in in Scotland were actually a little double hook, and I I use. In fact, you you might be interested. A, the fly that I was most successful with was the the alley shrimp. Oh, I know it all <laughs> okay. too well. Yeah, I've, I've met the man who designed it. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. I still have a bunch with me, and I still yeah. And I used a couple of, but the the alley shrimp was the best. And then what happened was I got I was fishing in the um out of the boat, and I said, you know, you know I I really don't want to do this and to uh, to the gilly and my partner said he wanted to fish out of the boat because he he uh he was a handicapped a little bit with one hand and so he could it was fish easier better. out the boat yeah yeah and they and so the ghillie suggested that i use a a, a a spay rod and i said no i don't need to use a spay rod i have a i have a very fine 10 foot sage rod for this purpose and I can use a shooting head. And so I said... And they probably uh, laughed at you, did they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. they said that. <laughs> and they, they did. So I said, I'm going to fish from shore. I said, I'll tell you what to do. I will fish from this side first of the shore and then when I finish here, if you'll take the boat and pick me up and, cro- and I cross the stream and I want to fish the other side. I said, but I'd rather fish from shore. And I would, and I had waders on, and I would stand up 
oh, I probably got in waist deep a couple of places. And I had wonderful fishing, and it was great. And, and they left me, they actually left me alone, and I did my own thing and caught a lot of fish. So <laughs> Tremendous. Time's gone by. So what was it that, why did you, why had you gone to Scotland in the first place? What was the reason for you going there? Were you, were you in search of fish, or were you over there with friends? Or That trip, we, my sole purpose was to go fish for Atlantic salmon. Okay. That's, uh, I didn't want to fish uh, trout. Uh, basically. And then we went on after the Tay, I fished the Spay. Uh, and we had a gilly that was there that was nice, nice, great guy. We fished that beat. It was raining that day. And, the, and but I caught two fish on the Spay. They weren't big, um, but they were nice fish. And also I hooked, uh, what's, What's the smaller fish? A grizzle or a uh, gri- uh, uh, grills? A grills. Yes, yeah, so a grills. one a one year run right. fish. And I, yeah, and I and I caught a grill. So what, what what was it about Atlantic? So you'd never fished for Atlantic salmon before. This was was this your first time? No, I did. I fished for Atlantic salmon uh, on the Panoy uh, in Russia. Okay, and. Uh, but I, I, in fact, the guy that I f- used to fish with, I just said, you know, I said, we have to go to Scotland. I said, that, that is the true place to catch Atlantic salmon. There's something about the history of it, isn't <laughs> the it? The history of it, absolutely. I said, you can go to Iceland and Greenland, and we have some good fishing. And I said, but I want to I wanna fish the Scotland for the... And so we did. It was a wonderful trip. I'm glad there's still a, a magic about <laughs> yeah. fishing in Scotland for, for, for people who are not from yeah. there. That's yeah. fantastic. I was reading about your kind of life story in Modern Huntsman, the, the interview that Tyler had done. Mm-hmm. And I was fascinated about your, your early life when you were working in, in Yellowstone, before you, were, you, before you became a teacher for 30 years. Mm-hmm. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and how you got to there. Well, actually, um, when I went... When I went to school, college, I, I, I uh, basically took up uh, industrial design, um, which also includes architecture, but, but as industrial designer. And uh, then I also took, uh, have a degree um, in biology. So I took in, um, it, was, uh, it was a minor in biology. And so I had a background, which I've always liked biology. So, and so after getting my degree, I did have a job for, I think, six months or a year as an d- industrial designer. And I just said to myself, I'm not going to, I'm not going to live in New York or Chicago. I'm, I, I'm going, I'm going to go west and and do what I want to do and, and fish and hunt. And I so I went, and I I got my degree in teaching. So I taught one year in Illinois, back in in Illinois, where I went to college. And just this uh, next year, I moved west. And I thought the further you moved west, the United States, the better the fishing it would be. So. I happened to drive through Livingston and stopped and saw the Yellowstone and fished that a little bit and kept on going and signed a contract in Washington in a small town in Washington, which had salmon, uh, the steelhead and salmon mostly. Um, and uh, really, the, really the fishing was not that great. The, the I can fishing. see where your motivation is <laughs> for your life story here. <laughs> There's definitely a river that runs through it, and there has to be fish in it. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. What, so, what year was this? Well, when was this? 1960 or yeah. 61. Either 60 or 61. Okay. So I went. I went to and taught in Washington, a little town in Washington. I was a I taught general science, and I was the basketball coach and the football coach and about everything, really small school. So my wife went back to northern Illinois to see her folks, and I said, I'm not going back. I'm going to fish. So I took off, and I went to Yellowstone Park, and I fished for a month straight, 
camped and fished for a month. By straight. yourself? Well, I went with another gentleman. Yeah, one guy. We and we camped. It was, and I fished that. And it was, and it was. We really had a great time fishing. It rained most of the time, and we didn't care. We fished, and so I went back and uh, that year and finished out. Oh, and, and and actually stayed there two years. So the second year I was teaching there and. I said, you know, I think I'm going to apply and see if I can get a job in Yellowstone in the in the summer to speak up because they had some summer jobs. So I applied. I applied in Glacier, Bryce Canyon, and Yellowstone, and for to be a naturalist there. So to, to make a short story, I was offered a, a job in in up in Glacier on the Western Slope, which is good fishing. But so I was going to take that and I was just ready to call and I got a phone call from Yellowstone and said, uh, if you're available, uh, we'd like to have you. So I said, I'll do it. So I said, where, where was the station I, I will be at? And, and they said, uh, at Lake, you'll be a, a naturalist at Lake. Which is right where I wanted to fish. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is the head basically Yellowstone River comes out of Lake Yellowstone in the park. Yes, so he's I right should explain by that. Right where yeah, the yeah, the yeah. cutthroat are spawning. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it is. It's the headwaters of the Yellowstone and River. So anyway, and then at that time in the '60s, there was called Fishing Bridge, and you could literally see hundreds of of uh, cutthroat trout, western cutthroat trout. Uh, or Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Um, so I was a naturalist right there. And so every day at four o'clock when I get off work, I would fish. I was about to say, let me get you go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and, with, and I would go out and, and fish. And I fixed a place called Buffalo Ford. I don't hear you might be familiar with that. Is that close uh, to Lahardy Rapids? Yes, it okay. is. Very yeah. close. And at that period of time, there was absolutely nobody there so i'd meet my wife would take our little volkswagen she'd come down and and we'd uh uh sit at a picnic table and 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 have uh supper there at lunch and and i would fish until dark so <laughs> and so i so what happened was at the time in the meantime i came through or before that i came through yellowstone or here to livingston and I just told my wife, I said, I'm just going to stop and see maybe I can find a job here. So anyway, I went into the high school in Livingston, Montana, and walked in and said, I'd like to, if there's any openings, I'd like to apply for a job. And the superintendent principal said, what do you, what do you teach? And I said, Anything, <laughs> and I said, actually, I can, I can, I can teach PE, and I can teach drafting, I can teach shop, and I can teach architecture, and I can teach art, and I can teach biology. And he said, oh, you're. In, he said, you know, we have an opening in shop. We called it. I guess uh, you. Would, what, what is that? Is that like? It's like workshops. So workshop, like so. working with tools, yeah. doing woodworking, that no, kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. Called industrial arts. Okay. So you. Teach kids to then and draft. You know what drafting is. Yep. Draft. So I was hired to t teach uh, the shop and drafting at the time. So and then we looked through. Uh, then then when we, we went back, it just so happened I I went back to Washington because I was just here, kind of looking at the park and trying to get a job and so forth. And by the time I got back, this the superintendent principal here had called my principal in Washington and said I was hired. So at the same time, I was hired in um, in Yellowstone. Okay, so, so you had two jobs in the go. <laughs> you know, one in the summer, yeah. and I could. So what happened is I I had two Britneys. That was in my well, that, those are my first two Britneys in 1960. Well, I got them in 50s, but. But I couldn't. I couldn't keep the dogs in Yellowstone, so I had to. I had to keep him in a kennel in Livingston. 
which I didn't like. So I so I rented a house and worked in Yellowstone. And after I got done in Yellowstone for that whole season, which I fished constantly, um, I started fishing the lower yellow of the Yellowstone here too. They offered me a full time job in Yellowstone. And I thought about it, uh, and I already had a job in teaching, and I said, you know, the problem with getting a job in a place like Yellowstone is that you have to, uh, if they want you to move to advance, uh, you you have to go. So so normally I would have stayed there probably three years or something like that, and then you'd have to move on. And I said, you know, I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stay in Livingston and be a school teacher, be poor and hunt and fish the rest of my life. <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> <laughs> so that's basically what happened. <laughs> so, but, but and, then, they, and then I taught here 30 years. And, and then also be, besides here, uh, I was, uh, I become a full-time sculptor also. I'm a sculptor. And then, and then uh, I also uh, was an architect at the same time, and just did primary homes. So besides teaching, I did sculpting and architecture. So you have a lot of strings to your bow, and and bird hunting. Okay, I know we haven't even touched on the bird hunting yet, and because the, the crazy thing is, all this amazing story that you've told us is what I knew you for was bird hunting. Yes. And yet we've been talking so much about fish, and I know that there's a, yeah. a great part of your, your history to yeah. do, to do yeah. with fishing. Was it something you were going to pick up on, Tyler? Um, no, I was just going to say, you know, w- with some of those things, there's, there's some of his bronze sculptures around town. Um, but I was going to say, so they actually went into Yellowstone for the first time last weekend. Oh, and, okay. You know, I, I know, I'm sure he's got more questions, but I was going to say, Ben, maybe give him just a short uh, little description of what you were doing in the park, how you were leading hikes and talking about the wildflowers and all of that. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Anyway, when you, when they hire you as a naturalist, you have a, a particular area. There was, I think there were probably 25 naturalists in, in all of Yellowstone. And I had, there was two of us in, called the Lake District up there. And we lived at Lake. We had a, we had a home up there. Or like a, it was like a trailer, a transit home, they called it, for that summer. So, but I had, my job basically was, one day I had work at the museum. Uh, There was a small museum there. And people would come in and ask questions. That's so I would do that. Then I gave, I gave, uh, twice a week, I gave two evening talks. I had to give a talk at seven o'clock, an hour and a half slide presentation to talk. And my subject was uh, basically mostly flora, flora and fauna, but mostly flora. Um, so, and then, and then with those two talks, one one day a week, uh, and at that time I was I was a photographer also, and you know have always been, and so I had the job uh, one day a week to actually go out and photograph for their files all the wildflowers. So I spent all my time photographing. Now back then we didn't have the kind of cameras we have now, so we had, in fact, the camera I used was a very small camera they I can't think of the name of it now but they used that camera for for dental work it was just a real small camera so you could get really but, close to the plants extremely close yeah. but what I had to do since since back in those days what I had to do with the with the flowers and the wind and so forth I would take I would take wire actually and I would wire up the flowers so they wouldn't move <laughs> to photograph them so so I did that. Then I so and then the after the, uh, the, uh, the two evening talks and I was at the museum once and then I had the photography once a, once a week. And then I also had a station that was called uh, the Dragon's Mouth. And that That's was a cool a, name. That was a, that was a uh, uh, like a big roaring pool. 
uh, that would go off about every hour or so. And my job for that day would I'd start at eight o'clock and I'd stay there till four and and take people and explain what was happening and show them the some of the paint pots around there. But the nice thing about it was that I was done at four o'clock and right across from from uh, where I was stationed was the Yellowstone River. So at four o'clock I could I could put on my waders and cross and fish and, and then my wife would come down and meet us. So <laughs> so it, it was it was a great job. It was and uh and I worked there from let's see, I had to go there at June about June fifteenth, no, about June tenth. And I was there until well, there until the last week in August, because school started here, I think, on the seventh of September. So, and all uh, these the, the people that you were giving talks to was that just members of the public that were coming in to, to yes, see Yes, what they park? do is they ha- you have a you have an outside uh, seating, uh, like a kind of an oval auditorium outside, and then you would you would I'd have a big screen, and then I would. T- I would show slides, mostly the slides that I took, and then I would, and then I would talk about all the different flora, and I, I, you know, and just talk about all the flowers and where you would find them and what hikes you could take to find them, etc. And then afterwards, uh, I'd have a people would ask questions, and then at the end, you were supposed to have a sing along. And I told people I couldn't sing, and I so <laughs> so that I didn't do. <laughs> Being so involved back then in in Yellowstone, you must have seen quite a change from then when you were involved in the park to you know just visiting it afterwards. What is the biggest change you've seen over the sort of thirty forty years in Yellowstone? Well, probably the biggest change is that the numbers of people naturally going in there. It's tremendous. But I, I think the biggest change is and when I was there, um, they used to feed the grizzly bears. There was a in in the park. In the park. Okay. There was a there was a garbage dump in the park. So uh and it was not very far from Lake. And uh we used to go there as naturalists, we would go there and sit there and watch the grizzlies. There'd be like 20, 30 of them fighting and everything else, eating the food there. And at that time, um, and in fact, one of the one of the campgrounds that I was up where I was stationed, um, as a naturalist, if, if there was a grizzly in the camp route or something, we would get a call and we'd go and get the grizzly out of there. So, And we did have a big mother grizzly that I can't remember within what we named her, but she would visit the campground quite often and they would get a call and have to come down and run her out of there and just clap her hands. And, and she was a nice big bear, but she... And so... And back in those days, people on the highway would feed the bears... Um, marshmallows, and there was no real restriction of that kind of stuff. And people would stop and photograph, and so it was a basically the park back then was much more lax, but there were a lot less people. So, I mean, we used to have bear jams, or you know, there maybe ten or fifteen cars that would stop and be a, 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 a some buffalo or a elk or a grizzly, and people would get out and photograph and. But nowadays, they they really don't let let, let people you, do that. Let no. that do that. No, we were so no. fortunate. Uh, I didn't expect to see as many uh, as many bison as we saw. It yeah. was it was it was incredible to uh, to see that for the first time. There are more bison. There are more bison there now than when I was there. I'd have to guess. I don't remember. I would say probably a thousand. Or I think there's a lot more than that now. I'm not. I, I don't know. I don't know. I what think the we number. probably saw about a lot four more. or five hundred when we were there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there were more grizzlies back then, uh, and probably not as many elk. 
but there were quite a few elk. Um, um, at that time, there were no wolves. They were they were eliminated back in those days and way before that. And now they're introduced back in there. So, so the introductions were after you left your yeah. time working in the park. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So what happened also then, so they, they did offer me a job. They offered me a job um, in, in September. And the, the first, the offer they gave me, basically, they wanted me to stay in Yellowstone Park. There was, there was a, they had one naturalist that would stay up in Old Faithful. And they wanted me to stay there. Okay, during the winter, which, which, uh, it's pretty harsh there in the winter. Yeah, well, you had to stay there. That was yeah. it. So they would, they would, they had some snow coaches back then. They didn't have the smaller coach, and they would just bring food in, supply food in for you. But uh, I can't say my wife was too excited about, about the doing prospect that, of that since we had a, a little girl that was. <laughs> Just in, or not in, even in kindergarten yet, and so she wasn't she wasn't too happy about doing that. So, but we haven't talked really at all about your passion for dogs. But that's run through this whole period time period that you've been talking about. That sort of run through the whole thing. Where did, where did that start? And and one breed in particular, I know. Well, basically, um, I had a dog when I was. Um, I got that dog. I got a dog, um, a hunting dog, when I was in seventh grade, um, in seventh and eighth grade, seventh grade, and it was given to us from uh, a woman that had it in Chicago, and the dog was just shouldn't have been in Chicago, and and but it was gun shy, and was given to us. It was a Springer Spaniel. It was a lovely dog. And I called it Mike, Mike the dog, <laughs> and and I didn't know anything about hunting, and and Mike didn't know anything about hunting, but together, <laughs> <laughs> but, but together we figured it out. So what I used to do, I used to take the dog, uh, actually take the dog hunting, but and I I lived out in the country. I had well, we had about twelve acres. That and but we had a nice old railroad tracks that we could hunt, and back then you could hunt almost any place. So I lived about a mile and a half from a small town uh, where I went to school. But the railroad tracks also went to that town. So where I lived, there was a highway in front of the house, and then and about a half mile back was the railroad tracks. So I would take Mike the dog, and I'd take my sh- shotgun, and I'd walk to school. And then Mike the dog would, I called him the, the uh, wait for me, or he would go back home, and he'd wait for me when I got out of school. And then I would, when I got close to school along the railroad tracks, I'd hide, uh, I'd hide my gun, and then... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I wish such I things were still possible. I haven't heard this story. You didn't <laughs> tell so me this good. story. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you and just hide it under a bush somewhere that you yeah, come I back just, and get it. Oh, I had a special place I yeah. hid it. And then and then uh I would I would get out of school and Mike was there and we'd walk back to railroad tracks and shoot at pheasants now and then. So and, you, and, and and mostly miss, but we would have a good but the problem was he was he was gun shy. So when I first started, in fact, I even wrote about it. When I first, the first time I had him out, I sh- I was on the railroad tracks and a pheasant got up and I shot and he and he went all he ran all the way back home. So I was really upset. So I unloaded my gun and I walked all the way back home. And he was under the back porch hiding. He was scared. And so I walked up and I called and called and talked to him and finally got him to come out. And I said, "Let's go hunting." So we. He went back out, and, and uh, for about a month, I I wouldn't shoot. I just I let the birds and it got so he would start chasing the birds, and and a, and eventually when I would shoot, he'd run maybe thirty yards and then come back. So, and he uh, would wait for you the whole time you're at school. As, as as far as I know, I mean, knowing Mike, he maybe did a little hunting. You know, around lunchtime and <laughs> yeah. so forth on his own. But. <laughs> That's, That's such a tremendous story. 
but but he was he, he was just a great dog. Yeah, and that um, that bit you. Yeah, that, that metaphorically well, bit you. That was absolutely where the dog yeah, and love I had started. A, I had a, f- I had and it didn't have a gun at the time, and I, I, I uh, got a newspaper route, and I sold seeds, and I finally bought a a gun. I sent to a, I don't know if you heard of a Montgomery Wards, but it was like Sears store, or it's a big chain store. And I finally saved up enough money, and I bought this gun. I can still remember it cost twenty eight dollars and fifty cents, but then I had to save for shells. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And it was a four ten. It was the nut. And and in fact, it was called a. It was a Stevenson gun, and so I had that gun. And then basically, then I had Mike through junior high and then my four years of high school and then at the end of high school uh the korean war broke out and i uh i took a test and i got out of i got out of school um my senior year early and left for the service uh i was 18 left for the service at and in january and then went into the service for four years uh, um, in the Navy uh, and spent most of my time in, in Europe. And then after that, I, I, uh, when I came out of the service, the first thing I wanted to do is I wanted to get a dog. And after a year, I worked for about a year before and then uh, signed up to go to college and back in Northern Illinois. And I and that was fairly good hunting then, so I said I'm going to get a Springer Sp- I, I, I'm going to get a a setter. So I kind of shopped around a little bit and got some information from a guy that had lived in DeKalb, where I was going to college, the uh, university there, and. Somebody said, I think that guy has setters. So I went to see him, and I asked him if he had a – I really wanted a setter. Uh, and I went to see him, and he said, no, I don't have setters. I have Britneys. And I said, well, I've never heard of a Britney. And he said, well, they're fairly new United States, and they're a fine dog. And, and he showed me, and I really liked them. They were just – and he had a dog named Mike also. <laughs> there you go. And yeah. I liked when he said Brittany Spaniels. I had a Springer Spaniel, and their Spaniel really connected with me. Mm. And we, said, we, we, both of us are big Spaniel fans. We both have Spaniels. <laughs> okay. We're Cocker Spaniels. Oh, they're wonderful. Yeah. 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 So, anyway, the Spaniel really kind of connected with me. The Brittany Spaniel, and then my do- Mike the dog, my Spaniel. It was just. And I said, well, you know, I really think about buying a dog from you. And I said, you know, I get, and he said, oh, he said, I, he said I'll tell you what. He said, um, why don't you, why don't you, no, he said, instead of buying a dog, he said, why don't you work for me and train dogs? And I said, well, I really don't know how to train dogs. I said, I, he said, well, would Brittany's they'll train you. <laughs> and so he said, I have a guy that's graduating from college that's leaving. And he said, I'd really like to have you work for me and, and you can train dogs. And when you graduate, I'll give you a couple of Britneys. And I said, it sounds like a good trade. I said, I'll do that. Yeah. So he had, he had one of the largest Brittany kennels in the United States at the time. He had about, he averaged about 60 dogs, something like that, something. So he was a field trialer also a little bit. So I did some field trialing for him. But what I would do is I would I would take my vehicle at the time and I'd go though after school or any time I had off, I'd just go pick up a couple dogs. And he had permission from all the ranchers around there that actually they were farmers and they uh, raised soybeans and, and corn mostly. 
So he had very good honey. And the DeKalb, Illinois, was extremely good bird honey, pheasant honey. Um, so what I did was I had permission of all the places he had to train dogs. And also I had permission to hunt there with his dogs. The best of both worlds. <laughs> the best of both worlds. So, and it's very interesting, I wrote about this, is that the year before I graduated, I was running my dogs. Um, I was walking down a, a, a swale, which which had no uh, corn stalks, and it was water, you know, very moist, so they couldn't grow any corn. It was a grassy swale, and I had a beautiful point and I walked up to expecting a pheasant and a covey of huns got up and that did it explain what for for our <laughs> European listeners explain what a hun is because we don't it's not something most people will be familiar well, with well you you have great partridge yeah in, in fact in yeah they're great partridge and we call them Hungarian partridge here and the reason we call them that is only because of the fact our original stock came from Hungary. And I I still call them Grey Partridge. So but I call them Huns for short too. But so anyway that I was extremely fascinated by that that bird. They're, the way that the way that they take off the sound, the well, way that there's flight the yeah. The squeaky gate. Yeah. That has they sound like a squeaky gate when taking off. And so then basically I I knew that Hungarian partridge were west, out west, but I didn't know where. But I, but so I left basically. So when I left Northern Illinois, that one year I taught there, and I taught to Washington. I figured, I know they have chuckers there, they have quail there, and I know they have pheasants there, and I wasn't sure if they had huns, and they, so. I left basically to go there to hunt and fish. And then when I graduated, I had my two dogs, Gina and Lola, and took off from the. And uh, when I taught there, naturally, I lived right there with a good bird country. And in northern Washington, I used to hunt up there. I'd go up there on the weekends and hunt. I found gray partridge. But so you must have been happy when you did. I was extremely <laughs> happy. I was hunting checkers and gray partridge, and and there were rough grouse there and blue grouse, and so I had a lot of variety of birds. And my dogs were not big running dogs at the time; they were they were pretty confined to run. But uh, then when I I knew that Montana had some good western birds. But nobody ever, nobody really ever said that they had Hungarian partridge. So when I got the contract here, I first started running right out here. I first started running dogs for sharp-tailed grouse and, 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 and sage grouse. I ran into Huns. So they were here. <laughs> they were here. And you were happy again. <laughs> and nobody hunted them. So at that period of time, was upland bird hunting a big thing here in Montana, no, or was it in its infancy? No, no. They thought, I'll even tell you the story of the first, when I got here, I worked in the park. I, I rented a house in April, in March. No, it was April, March. And I went up in the park to work and then got the job down here in September. And the season, the bird season started. So I, I bought a, I had a fishing license that I, a non-resident fishing license, but I wanted a bird hunting license, but an out-of-state bird hunting license was a lot of money then, like 30 bucks, you know. And so I counted all the days, and I had to be here six months. And... I had about five months to go, and I said I, I couldn't stand it. I said I I gotta go. I gotta go. So I went over to see the uh, the game warden at his house, and, and he was he was a pretty tough guy. You know, he's a pretty tough game warden. And I explained that I had a job in Yellowstone. I rented a house here, 
and I was a teacher full time here, and I had my driver's license here, and so I had everything in order. Could I have a hunting? Li- could I buy a hunting license for a resident? And he was a little hesitant at the time, and said, "Well, uh, yeah, I guess so." And he finally said, "Ah, uh, yeah, we can call that six months." He said, "We're a little short, but you can." And he said, uh, uh, "I said I'll give you a license." He said, "Now an elk tag." He said, an "Elk license is going to cost like I can't remember like ten. I said, "I don't want to hunt elk." And I said, "I don't want to hunt a big game." And he said, "Are you sure?" He said, "You don't." <laughs> I said, no, "I want to hunt birds." He said, "Birds?" He said, "Nobody hunts birds here." He said. You know, when you hunt elk, he said, you can go up in the mountains and you can hunt blue grouse up there with, when you're elk hunting. I said, no, I, I want to hunt huns, partridge. And he said, nobody hunts partridge. And I said, well, I would like to. And he said, all right. So he made out the license. It was $6 in the license. And so he made out the license. He said, where do you plan to hunt? And I said, well, I've been running my dogs east of town and I... I can hunt any place I like. Back then, you could hunt any place because if it wasn't posted, you could hunt. And I said, but am I running my dogs there? And he said, well, son, I'll tell you what. He said, between you, the coyotes, and the rattlesnakes, you're going to have the place to yourself. <laughs> he said, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> he had no hope of you having any kind of success. <laughs> he just thought it was crazy. <laughs> so really, basically what happened was I would go out after school, take my little, I had a little blue Volkswagen, 1950s Volkswagen, and go out, take my two dogs. Well, had, then actually I had three. What, a year later I had, I got a dog uh, by the name of Mike. I called him Mike. Another again, Mike. Mike. Mm. Which I changed the name eventually to, to well, that's a long story too, but I wound up with two bikes. So I changed the name, one to Iron Mike because he was muscular, and the other the other little Mike, that my first Mike, I called him McGillicuddy. I, I can see a theme with Mike. Have you always had Mikes? <laughs> yes, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> So anyway, I just had, I would go out after school, I'd be out of school at four o'clock and I would take off and I'd hunt every night till dark. And everybody in, everybody in, out in this country, up to Clyde Park and all this country, up where he lives, everyone knew this school teacher with these Volkswagen, and crazy school teacher with three dogs running around chasing birds. And, and you had the place to yourself. No one else was doing it. No, nobody ever. No. Oh. No, I'd just drive up and down the gravel road, and we'd see, I'd see a nice field or see a cubby hunts, stop the car, pull over, and go out and hunt. Everybody That's incredible. Just, yeah. And I did that for, oh, I don't know, probably 10 years. And, and then it starts, then they started to close down a little bit. But I knew so many ranchers and so many people, and I had a lot of kids in school that... <laughs> Well, had parents, parents. Had parents. <laughs> yeah. I so, so I had a, I had, a, I had a place. I had a really had a. On on parents' evening, well, Jimmy could be doing better. <laughs> oh um, yeah, yeah, I knew. I had a, I had a boy. I had a, a boy up. I used to hunt ducks also. Right after the, after and and, and McGillicuddy was my duck dog. In fact, I wrote a story about McGillicuddy, the, the duck dog, and so I would take him. But anyway, I had a student up the valley that came, and it was one of my classes, and and he knew I hunted, and he said, Mr. Williams, he said, I got a nice little duck pond. He said, well, there's ducks there. And he said, would you like to hunt it? And I said, oh, and I thought, well, it's just a little pond. I don't, you know, I won't bother. So I didn't pay much attention to it. So I'm driving back. This is up by Pine Creek. I'm driving back in Pine Creek, and I happen to see this kid I had in school and he stopped me and he said I want to show you the duck pond and I said well okay I was, I was hunting ducks and so I took he got in the guy took the down there well it was beautiful spring creek duck pond I mean it was huge 
and there were all kinds of ducks. Um, it's surprising as his grade went from a C to an A. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the common bond of hunting. It's amazing what it can do. Yeah. So anyway, I hunted that for, it was wonderful. It was a wonderful place to duck. It was just, in fact, when everything else was frozen, it was a spring, it was springs there, warm springs, and all the ducks were there. And in fact, I, I just wrote a story about uh, McGillicuddy. So I had, I had McGillicuddy, and we used to do, we used to do a lot of jump shooting. What's jump shooting? Instead of putting decoys out, you would, you would crawl up on a bank, or we'd go up and, and you, you flush the birds and flush the birds. Okay, yeah, and that's called jump shooting here. Yeah. Um, but so I used to take just the one dog, just, just McGillicuddy. So McGill, in, in fact, uh, this is the, the story I wrote just recently. So McGillicuddy was a great dog. And so we used to try to sneak up on our hands and knees. I'd, well, I'd crawl and sneak up on our hands and knees. And he, he'd be alongside of me. Crawling as well. Crawling along with me, and then he'd hear all the ducks quacking, you know, and he couldn't stand it. I mean, absolutely couldn't stand it, and he'd break, <laughs> and he'd and, I, and he and it was a high and he and he dove over this big high bank, and he just lit right in the middle of ducks, you know. And he, of course, he thought he was doing his great, you know, it just That's whole his job. ducks came. Yeah. Well, yeah, he thought he was doing the job. So, I we had a funny told. Told McGillicuddy, he said, "You know, this is going to hit. This is going to have to work. You're going to have to learn." But, but he he was so intent about finding those ducks for me, he had a hard time doing that. So what I did was I went out, I went to the grocery store and bought a a, a roll of twine. In fact, you see that the little twine, yeah, that I white twine it. up there. I bought a twine. So what I would do is I would take the twine, and then I would tie it on his collar, and then I'd take about 15 feet of it, and I would be sneaking up in the ducks, and I would tie it to a willow branch, so make him stop. So he'd crawl up and... Get to the end of his tether. End of the tether, and he wouldn't move then. So, But what I did was so I tested the string, so... When I shot, he would plunge and break the string. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it was, I, I call it my string trick. <laughs> did, did he ever learn that that was the game and you didn't need the string anymore? Yes, he did. He did. Yeah, in fact, I wrote about it. And then he, he eventually learned the game was, you know, we stay together. But see, when I was crawling up, sometimes I would crawl up on the on the rocks, you know, on the on the rocks along the uh, river and, and, you know, out of sight of the ducks. So I'd have to tie him farther back into the willows. So, <laughs> but it's amazing how the dogs learn eventually. <laughs> but but he, and he got, he got great about it. And then I, when I finished the story. I finished as this story because I was hunting with a good friend of mine and, and, uh, McGillicuddy was a he was a real character. He was a wonderful dog. And he was always thinking. Okay. <laughs> so I'm I'm hunting on, on a spring creek up the valley in a little creek and we we're walking right on the edge of the bank, my partner and I. And I told my partner, I said, you know, I'm gonna go over. I said, there's a little spring over here. I'm gonna deviate a little bit and I'm gonna go over here and see if there's anything over there. So I deviated, I was about fifty yards from my partner, I could still see him, but I, so I went over there, and sure enough, the two Mellards got up and and, and uh, shot and killed both of them, and and one fell in the water, and one fell on just beyond where this little spring was, and McGillicuddy took off and retrieved the duck to me, the first duck. Then he went back down, got the other duck, and retrieved retrieved it to my partner. Because he knew it was his duck. No, I I shot both shot? ducks. Oh, but McGillicuddy figured that, you know, you got to be fair. <laughs> so 
he <laughs> wanted to share the spoils. <laughs> yeah. So so he gave my partner the other duck. <laughs> I, I've, I've been on I've been on shoot days before, where I've seen Labradors go and pick up pheasants that another dog has just retrieved and placed at the owner's feet, and then the labs go and pick up that and bring it back to the just yeah, yeah, yeah. Hoovering birds, yeah. Hoovering birds up. They're all mine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's incredible. So and so that that Mike Mike then uh, was from the Oberlin Kennels in Illinois. So when I start really start developing dogs, what I want to do, I wanted the dogs become big running dogs because it's big country. So Britneys at the time, and my Britneys were from France originally, so they um and so what I did was I found out through a a man I met that was in the fly shop that was a field trial judge. There was a man in, uh, by Jim Lebrick in Texas that uh, had some big running Britneys. So I called Jim, and I bought a couple of, of females from him, my two two original females from back east. I didn't use as breeding dogs, but McGillicuddy I did. So over the years, I think I bought probably 10, 12 dogs from uh, from. Jim Lebrick. So then I used that particular bloodline on the on the female side and my male side on the northern Illinois sideline and developed my own bloodlines. And I, what I wanted, I developed bigger Britneys, whiter Britneys, so I could see them. Um, and then back in those days, we didn't have shot collars or beepers, so it was just with whistles. So I so there are a lot of times I would have a dog way out there in the 60s, and I'd have to go and look for it to find him um, and use a whistle sometime. But but since the, the beeper collars, basically, and the shot collars that come in, uh, there's there's really no need for whiter dogs, you know, so. but And you just, you wanted the dog bred in that way just so it could work more ground? Yeah. Which, little side note for Ben, was practical because that meant he didn't have to walk as far. <laughs> I see. You make the dogs do the work. Yeah. And that's absolutely correct. Yeah. yeah. When I first started hunting in the 60s, I'd walk, on a Saturday, I'd walk 20 miles hunting with my dogs. And today, I can, I can that 20 miles, I can walk four miles or three miles, and my dogs will cover that. So my dogs will run, see, they'll run, well, the longest, the longest point I had, it wasn't last year, the year before, uh, was 750 yards. But I had a, a tracking collar at the time. So you knew where the dog was. But I don't use that tracking collar very much. I know if I see the dog go in that direction, and he's been with me, those dogs will and what I use, I don't use shot collar. I don't believe in shot collars. I use just the beeper, just the beeper. So they color. hear the audible beep when you press the button. Yeah, and I have that. And two of my or three of my dogs, two one of my two of my pointers and one of my Britneys. When I and if you beep a lot, it'll scare the birds a lot of times. Especially Hans get a little jumpy. But what I what my dogs have learned is I beat them several times, and they know that. I can't see them. They'll break point, turn around, and come back over a hill, make sure I make contact with them, then turn around and bend back and point. That's incredible. Yeah. It is. And there are they're, they're, they're actually dog people that say, uh, it's not. It's true. I mean, it's... But it's did, they, did they just work that out, or how did you train them to I, do that? I, they just did it. They just started no. doing it. I, I've never trained a dog in my life. They trained me. <laughs> well, and the thing that Ben's always told me about his dog training is that he he's very insistent on letting dogs be dogs. Yeah, let them figure out. Yeah, the book, my book is yeah, just let a dog be a dog. In fact, I even I even have a chapter in my dog training book is called "Woe is Me." I don't use the word "woe." I said <laughs> my dogs are smart enough; they don't have to woe. <laughs> they stop. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I don't have to tell them the woe. <laughs> I like that. I like that. 
So but I don't. I don't think. I think. Uh, and I have. I have pointers too. I've had a lot of pointers, but I don't breed. I haven't. I don't breed pointers. I was just breeding Britneys. Now, now we call them American Britneys naturally, you know, which is crazy. They're still French Britneys, you know. So, but just as soon as. Just as soon as Britneys came to America, you know, they they thought they ought to have, uh, well, number one is that the American Kennel Club basically did not recognize Britneys. They called them Spaniels then, Britney Spaniels. They didn't recognize the tricolors. So they either had to be orange, or, orange and white or liver and white. And uh, so... Has that changed now? Oh, absolutely, yeah. And so the American Kennel Club got their nose all bent out of shape and said, this is, you know, and then finally they said, well, these are American Britneys. And the French said, fine, we'll have French Britneys. <laughs> so we'll have them tricolors. <laughs> so now, so now we, now we have French Britneys and now we have American Britneys, which are all the same. <laughs> In fact, when I wrote the one, the Encyclopedia of Sporting Dogs, my editor, I I wrote I wrote the uh, the section on all pointing breeds, and I said I'm gonna I'm gonna name them just I'm gonna call them Britneys Spaniels are fine. We got you know we had to drop the spaniel too. You know that's uh, so my publisher convinced me he said no Ben you're gonna have to write American Britneys and French Britneys. I said, well, I'm not going to say much different about them, but so that's so you I, had you had to relent. And I, I had well, I had to do that. Yeah, I yeah. know. I know for a fact there's people that from the UK now that want to get their hands on your books. Yeah, I, oh, yeah. I, I I'm going to make sure we get the links to them <laughs> and so where they can be found. Just because I've had the privilege of spending so much time with Ben, if I remember correctly, you've written ten and co-authored five, correct? Yeah, my newest one, I, uh, yeah, I think it's now, yeah, it's 15, I yeah. guess, 16, yeah. yeah. So yeah. there was other books that he, you know, co-authored, but for the most yeah, part. Yeah, there are several, yeah. like the Encyclopedia was, is a, is a, uh, I think there's five authors, because I didn't want to write the Retriever breeds and the the Fuzzy Dog breeds. <laughs> you wanted to do what you were passionate about, <laughs> yeah, what you knew. Yeah, and then American Wing Shooting, I, 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 uh. I think American wing shooting is the one that I've, yeah, I've read. Yeah, you've, you've looked through that one. Western yeah. wing. The the, American. This one here. This well, one. Ben, just watch. You're going to. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> you're connected still. <laughs> um, grab, I, I have you yeah, yeah, yeah. Grab that. And, well, one thing that I was going to say that I, I know that they're very interested in the habitat. And I know that a large part of your hunting, too, was based on you learning about the bird's habitat. So maybe talk to Byron a little bit about, um, you know, what you learned through some of that grouse stuff. Yeah. One of the habitats that's always fascinated me because of the the species connection with sage grouse is sagebrush. So, w what is it? Just to give uh, our listeners at home an idea about the importance of that habitat, in, in particular the sagebrush habitat. What is it, is it about it that has made it so important and a topic that people are talking about a lot? Because I know there isn't as much of it as the as there used to be. So the, the oh. habitat depletion is a big issue, and yeah. and in, ter in terms of restoring it as well. Probably from the start, the, from the time I started hunting sage grouse, um, in the '60s, I could go and hunt sage grouse, and it wasn't unusual to see 150 birds. Uh, I've seen more than that. Um, and some of the places I used to hunt, basically, there are no sage grouse left. And is that because the habitat isn't there, or, or the Abs grouse? Absolutely is? no. It's it's habitat, habitat, habitat. That's all there is. And, I mean, and why isn't it there anymore? What's what's happened? What's changed since the sixties? Lax environmental issues. Uh, Overgrazing is that a part, is that an issue? Overgrazing by cattle or oh, other animals? Actually, grazing on sage sagebrush habitat is not bad. That that's not the reason. It's plowing it up. Miles so man-made destruction. Man-made destruction is mostly 
we were just we're losing thousands of acres that are being plowed under. Yeah, or ripped up. And the sage grouse, for them, that habitat is essential. You do you don't you have can't, you can't yeah. you don't have them without it. Right, you can't yeah. And here's something else. I, this is really important. You want to you want to try to remember is maybe in writing it is that through studies of sage grouse now, compared to 30 years ago, you know the the invention of the small radio collars tracking birds. You know they always thought sage grouse basically, well, and I talk about a shift. Sage grouse will shift. Not migrate. I call it shifting. They, they, sage grouse have a winter range, a a nesting range, or a, or in a rearing range. Okay, so they they have they move. So on their they're a lek bird, and some of the leks were like 150, 200 birds on those leks, and then what they, a sight that must be. Yeah, they're beautiful to watch. In fact, I have photographs of them in. And say all the males will kind of the females will congregate, and then the males are basically kind of isolated. They they do not they do not take care of the young, or do not after breeding they do not associate basically with uh, the female. She raises the young herself. So what she does, and then she she will nest in a an area very fairly close within a couple of miles of that those leks um and then in the fall basically in the fall because of the food source is they will make a shift and they will travel sometimes a long ways now we always we always thought it, they would travel like 15 miles and so forth so um but they have found out through radio coloring now that some of those migrations of basically a and I don't like to use the word migration, but I like to use the word ship. They will, they will move two hundred miles. So, if you stop and think about that, then is that so? For a sage grouse to exist, you have to have these. You have to have their winter range, their nesting range, their 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 uh, brood range. And their and their fall range, so if you take one of those elements out, you break the cycle. You break the cycle, and so I mean, I have a lot of ranchers. They'll uh, friends will say, "Well, I haven't changed the habitat at all." Well, most of them have, but they say, "Well, I don't change." My answer is, "You may not have, but their winter range is gone." Yeah. And they did, uh, and that that range is obviously determined by environmental. Not sorry, not environmental, but the the climate at that time yeah. of year, and yeah. it being sympathetic to them yeah. being able to survive. Yeah, I'm gonna give get a grab that one that best grab the best day uh, th that little one right there, and then grab that grab that western that old western range because I went right there that west yeah. I'm going to have you read uh, read the intro. I just want this. Yeah, I wrote okay. it in each. So there's a little poem at the beginning. Do you want me to just read this poem? Just a, yeah, okay. just a little, yeah. A dawn wind stirs over the great sea of sage whispering a lonely message of the passing of a prairie bird. The sea is shrinking at an alarming rate. A single species of grouse hangs on. It could be the hunter that saves the hunted and he saved the wild turkey. That's basically it, you know. And now we're having, we were having some real, real problems now, basically with the, the, some of the best sage grouse habitat. They're starting to drill wells and disturb a lot of a lot of disturbance. There's, there's a lot going on with trying to save the, the grouse and the habitat. Habitat, yeah. So, what role are our hunters playing in that? Because obviously, there's a vested interest there because hunters are enthused by the species, people, and all game birds. And I and I I know in in England and Scotland they would probably disagree with this, but when it comes to predation and humans hunting them, that's that is not even a factor. 
basically. It doesn't have an impact on them. The amount of birds that are killed uh, by predation and is about maybe 10% of each. It has nothing. How, what happens to birds is, is habitat. If you, if you take away the habitat, they're gone. If you take away the habitat of the monarch butterfly, they're gone. It has nothing to do with, you know, if you take away, you know, nobody shoots monarch butterflies. Okay, is a good example. <laughs> and, they, and, and it's, it's where they live, and, they, and, that's, and that's what's happening. You know. Is there work going on to, or what work is going on to protect the oh, sagebrush yeah. habitat that exists? That must that must be happening. We're f- we're fighting very very hard. All the biologists in different states are working very hard to try to really save the grouse. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and is that by just having areas of protection where that habitat can't be touched anymore? Well, little by little. Little by little, we're trying to stop it, but it's it's happening, you know. Um, I must say that Montana has the gr- most gracious hunting of all the sage grouse. I think we're still, we used to have, was, our season used to be as long as all the rest of bird season. Now I think it's over in November, but it's still, it's still from September 1st till November 1st, I think. And I think you're still allowed. The last time I looked was three sage grouse or two, and I when I write about it, I always write about just just uh, go hunting with your dog and so forth, but just shoot a trophy bird, you know, just one bird is fine. Just um, whether you shoot three t- would not have an impact on that. Um, the nice thing about it is Montana has the, the, now the largest still has the largest population of sage grouse and you can still you can still hunt sage grouse in eastern montana and have an extremely good hunt and i would uh, guess that's directly tied to the amount of sage brushes here it, it is tied to it's that particular area is tied to one it's the largest it's the largest block of 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 uh, blm in the united states it's thousands and thousands of acres of nothing but sagebrush. It's about 100 miles long and wide. So it's an immense piece of habitat. It's extremely, yeah. And we're talking about, let's go go up a little bit. Uh, I see sage chickens at the top there. Yeah, just go ahead and just, just, just read that. I just, uh, this kind of explains it, what I'm... All right, reading. so they're at... This this bar doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. This was in Clyde Park or Wilson. I'm not saying where it's okay. Low. It's a no. secret location, <laughs> no. not to no. be <laughs> divulged. No. no, it's not. So no. it says uh, sage chickens are just like my band of sheep. He's talking with a sheep herder. Sage chickens are just like my band of sheep. They roam all over. He says and taps his finger on the bar, indicating he's ready for another beer. Like to eat them? He asks. I do, if fixed right. I answer. Well, he says, I'll plink a young one for a stew once in a while, but not the older ones. Just then, one of the one of the road workers shifts over. One of the road workers drifts over after hearing our conversation and interrupts. I'd hunt the big reservoir north of here if I were you. See grouse every time I, we go by there. He assures me and waves goodbye. Dolly cuts in and says, "You don't have to go any further than beyond the schoolhouse to get a wagon load of sage hens." Itching to leave, I stand, pull change from my pocket, slide it to Dolly, and thank them for the information and say, "Have a beer on me." As I exit, they wish me luck. Back then, the topography was a sea of high plains and historical sagebrush, which spread out for miles. The big, beautiful grouse of Powder Basin were everywhere. Today, Coyote Creek still holds a brook trout, but the bar is gone. The one-room schoolhouse is boarded up, and the continuous sage cover, which was critical for holding large populations of grouse, is now broken. Because of this, I never hear talk of 20-mile or grouse hunting Powder Basin anymore. Just like that, it's changed. (laughs) <laughs> Absolutely. There's no grouse up there anymore. Just a few, but no, I don't hunt it anymore. Yeah. It's and a sad I, it's a sad story, but one that I hope uh, you know people are becoming increasingly aware of that impact and can work towards trying to restore what's been lost. Yes, I agree with that. I mean, that's probably uh in reference to your country, that's 
that's what's happened over there with your Atlantic salmon, is they finally realize that, you know, we have to... They're realizing it now, but it's like, it's right on the cusp. It's on the cusp of, is it even retrievable? But we're increasingly, in terms of the public, realize that we've got a problem. And ours, sage grouse, that's probably a good term. It's right on the cuff also, you know, so... And we're all going to have to try and work out what role we're going to play to try and make a difference. We can't, uh, we, we can't all be involved in all of it, but I think probably finding something you're passionate about, whether it be Atlantic salmon or sage grouse and sagebrush, and just see how you can absolutely. play a role. It abs- absolutely. You know, the, if we don't do something, it's going to be gone. I mean, just like, just like the buffalo. I mean, you know, that. They were literally when Lewis and Clark basically came west. The first folks to come west, they were there, you know, and uh, explored the west. Literally, there was thousands and thousands of sage chickens. They called them. Yeah. Moving back to to fishing, because there's, there's a part of the the story of fishing that I just wanted to touch on just before we wrap up this podcast. It was your role with Trout Unlimited and the work that you guys did back then tell us how that how that came about and because i know that you were involved in setting up the chapter here yes yes i was Uh uh-huh it makes sense given your fascination with fishing and um yeah what i did was i my i I loved the fish so i first person i wanted to meet was dan bailey's dan bailey's fly shop in fact i just article just I just wrote about Dan fishing the South Fork, I call it. But and he had a, that fly shot become very famous, um, and so and Dan was a wonderful, wonderful person. Um, and uh, so I summers teaching. I first thing I didn't I wanted to do was I wanted to work in the fly shop. I didn't make any money there, but I wanted to work there. And so, and so Dan and I become extremely good friends. In fact, I designed his house, his new house, when he, and back then. And so, uh, there was a, there was a, some people that came here in the summer that want that was in, in Trout Unlimited. There was was just getting started. It was just it wasn't even national hardly. It was just getting started. And there was a woman that started called the Montana chapter and it never went with one year it died it never went anywhere um and it just so happened that it, i think there were 20 members or something or maybe not even that and so and she didn't it didn't go any place so i was concerned about that and dan was and so i i approached dan and i said you know why don't or maybe he approached me i don't know which but he said you know we we said we should start a chapter in trout unlimited uh, just for background on Trout Unlimited, what's the purpose of the organization for those people who are not aware of it? Well, basically the p- preservation of trout and trout fishing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a conservation organization, basically, for the betterment of trout <laughs> trout fishing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a very good organization. And so what we did was, so I was working at the fly shop at the time and and. Dan said, yeah, I said, you know, Dan, we should start a chapter, and why don't you be the president? And I said, I'll, I'll be the secretary. And he said, no, I don't want to be the president. I have a fly shop. He said, why don't you be the president, and I'll be the, I'll be the treasurer. So I said, well, we have to round, round up a few guys. So I round up about five guys, and we started – we started – the Yellowstone chapter of Trout Unlimited. And we had about, we had about the first year, we had about, fine, we wound up with about eight, ten members. But the neat thing about it is that all of all of Dan Bailey's out-of-state out of guests, we would sign up for Trout Unlimited. <laughs> okay? So our chapter got very large. Okay? <laughs> Even though they they weren't from here, so but they were coming here to fish. Yeah. yeah. So we had a first chapter. So then we had to have we had to have we had to have five chapters in Montana 
to have a state council. So we created four other chapters, okay? We went out and got a guy in Lewistown and three or four members in Butte. I think there was one in Kellis, but one in Helena. So we created these chapters in... And basically, we created this chapter because we wanted a state council, to, and to have a state council, we could do some legislative work. Okay, so we got it happened. So we finally got a state. I was the chairman of the state council. Um, they for I think for twelve years, something like that. But anyway, so so then we had a lot of members from out of state, and so in. In legislation, you always got to have numbers. When you talk to politicians or senators and representatives, you don't say, my organization has five people. My organization, we have lots of people. I mean, from all over. And we're serious, okay? Because they won't vote. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So basically, the four so... We even hired. We even hired a lobbyist. One of the guys we even, and we gave the lobbyist. We gave him five hundred dollars, okay, to do lobbying for us, okay, and, and uh, which we, back then was quite a bit of money. But and so, what were you lobbying for? Well, we're lobbying for a lot of things. Uh, for number one, first thing we did is we they used to take car bodies. And use rip wrapping for the river. So it was called the Car Body Act. We stopped that. We stopped ranchers and people from putting their car bodies in the river. Um, and, and for rip wrapping. Well, I, rip wrapping is not something. I'm so not, is that uh, yeah. to create habitat or to slow the water down? No, not a habitat. It's the, to slow the water slow down, the or, water down, or cutting into the bank. Ah, okay. R- rip yeah, wrapping yeah. is when it starts. You, you start using land. The rancher was losing his land, so yep. you rip wrap it. Okay. And yeah. they'd use car bodies. Got you. And, and yeah, instead of something a bit more sympathetic. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. But I did catch. I caught a. I. I caught a back in the six. I caught a very very large big brown trout out of a. Back seat of a Chevy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what he was doing back there. Yeah. <laughs> I can understand why that is uh, something you'd want to stop happening on a pristine yes. river. Yes, and that's so. Then the next thing we did was and this was very quiet, and we had a, some very good legislations back then. Some some senators and rep. The next thing we did was we said. This is a free flowing stream. We want to stop that. We don't want any dams on here. So we stopped that. That was took a ten year fight, but we that we, we initiated that. But the important thing what we want to do, we wanted to make called the stream access bill. We wanted to make the Yellowstone and all the rivers in Montana for anyone to fish, not private. And with the amount of chapters we had in the state council and having a lobbyist and all that, we put a lot of, really a lot of pressure on the legislation. And at the time we had a, a good governor and some pretty strong people that were in legislation. But I can honestly say we snuck that when people were sleeping. <laughs> And we got it. We, and it's still there to this day. We yep. passed. Ever since then, they've been trying to get rid of it. The people won't allow that, surely. Well, it's it's ranchers, you know, who... They don't want to allow a, the access a lot, Yeah. Well, and, and as Ben and I talked about in my interview, there are some people who abuse it who, you know, you're not supposed to go above the high water mark. Yep. But technically, you can float or walk the banks of any river in Montana. But there are some ranchers who harass anglers or put up temporary fencing to block boats from going through. Yeah, I would I would say, yeah, I don't like to use the word rancher. Sure, that, sure. That method. Because a lot of ranchers are... are we're very supportive at the time, but yeah. what the biggest problem we have now is a lot of wealthy people moving in and buying pieces of land on the river, and then trying to not trying to close it, not allow access. To Those it. are the ones. The, the, it's 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 the old the, the the 
the I think the old the the the, old, the 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 ranchers that have been here a long time and so forth they they have no problem with that they you know you can't you just can't drive across a piece of private property and fish so that's why we have excess but you are allowed to float you're allowed to go any place you like along the river on the and you can hunt ducks too yeah. and and it's it's the high water mark. And that's where the fight comes in sometimes. But where is the high water mark? Is that the Well, it's pretty obvious and saying but But is that but, where the controversy lies? Yeah, and then what what some people in on the Ruby and some of those rivers over there were doing was they were they were buying land and putting a f- fence across it, wire fence across so when you floated you You couldn't get through. Well they you could, but you know, they be it's pretty hazardous. Yeah. But it basically it it was basically a lot of rich people that moved in here and tried to stop it, you know. And that was so that was the one thing we got through, which was That's a massive win. That was incredible. Uh, Colorado's been trying that for since we've had ours. Colorado's been trying that forever. They still can't get it. And I'll, I'll tell you today. With our legislation and so forth, we'd never gotten it. We we got lucky. We hit it at the right time, and I can honestly say, back then, it wasn't that controversial. And let's say a lot of legislation, I think, were sleeping. <laughs> okay, when that went through, I'm not kidding you. <laughs> and you also had a role to play in a really large um, designation for a wilderness area. Yeah, the largest. The, in fact, the largest designation in in, in uh, Montana. What was the motivation behind pursuing that? We wanted to preserve this mountain, these mountains. With the we wanted to preserve the uh, the Absorkey Beartooth Range. And the nice thing about that is, during that period of time, it was the game warden, by the way, that gave me the license that worked with me <laughs> with us. He was. He was very instrumental, and there was two other people, and he did some research. I think, it, but basically, it, there were five of us. Dan Bailey was one, myself, and then Joe Halderman, or Joe, Joe Halderman, and Joe Gobb. I can't remember. Yeah, but it was in it was in my article for Modern Huntsman. Right, another. Yeah. So I was I was I was a I was in Trout Unlimited. And I was I was the chairman of the council and the chairman here of the of this uh, the lo- local chapter, so we, we were it was it was really good for me to support it because we had numbers you know we we could we could really you know we could say we got numbers, uh, so we got together we just sat down on a big map and Joe Gobb the, actually the game warden he was the one that said. Just took a big man and said, well, okay, this, let's just do this. <laughs> oh, let's add this too. So we just took this whole mountain range from here to Yellowstone Park, practically all the way to Billings. Took the Beartooth, that whole range. And at that time, there was very little mining interest in that. The logging was not that good in that part of the country. So those were not really... You weren't fighting those interests it, as much, yeah. yeah. So, and, and I think it ended up being nine hundred and forty-four thousand acres. Yeah, I think like I that. wrote it down. It yes, was, yeah. almost yeah. a million. An unbelievable. So what? So an- another thing that happened, I have but to say, at that period of time, um, at that period of time, b- both of our senators were Democrats. Um. And our representative was a Democrat, and we had a Democrat, but that was legislatively, that that body. And Medcalf and Mansfield were extremely good about doing that. They were very strong. And they were, they were very, very inf, inf, influenced the rest of the United States. So they had a lot of, they had a lot of power in the Senate. And so basically what happened was that we went to Medcalf and Mansfield and said, could you 
present this. And we said, we have Trout Unlimited, we have the Six Gara Club, we have this piece, and we have this, we have the Wilderness Society, we have all these people that want this preserved, and there's not very much mining going on, there's the, the logging is not that good, let's preserve that. Now, we had some flack. We had some flack. Number one is every politician, you always, the first thing that came out was it was a playground for the rich. My answer is no, it's a playground for the poor, not the rich. Okay. But, but we had some flack from mostly from, uh, from towns or, or municipalities because they said, you know, uh, if you put that in the wilderness, nobody will come, blah, blah, this kind of stuff. And, but we were very quiet about it. Mansfield, I think he died before it was introduced. Uh, but, a Metcalf, yeah. Or Metcalf, excuse yeah, me. Yeah, and, and so it actually, I, I think it had something to do with the passing of it that people wanted to honor his legacy. So they really got behind it to help it push through. Support that's it. that's correct. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. His legacy and also, and then they have... The Lee Metcalf Wilderness. They also have a Met, Met, Metcalf Wilderness. But he was very instrumental in, like I say, and, there, and that was one of, he is correct, one of the things that... After his death, people said, you know, this is what we ought to do, because he worked hard for Because he was us. fighting for it. Yeah. yeah. So what is it, What is it now that it's been designated, what does it mean to be a wilderness area as a, as a designation? What, There's what less, is the protection that oh, that allows? Okay. The protection is you can go on foot or horseback. You can go on horseback, but no motorized vehicles. You can go any place you like, everyone. It's... It's open to all. It's open to all for hiking and fishing. And there's hundreds of lakes up there. And there's all kinds of trails. And it's maintained for that purpose. And uh, I, I guess there's restrictions on any kind of development or extraction or anything like that. Yep. You can't do it. None. Nothing. It's diff- the difference between, you know, what we when we say public land, right? Yep. Within public land, there's different designations. A wilderness area like this one is pretty pretty High remote level of protection. pretty pretty primitive uh versus you know a, a state forest where there's maybe some logging going on or or people can take ATVs back there and stuff like okay. that this no, is you can't. yeah, yeah this so this is, is like the highest level of pretty much of protection. wilderness yeah. protection Le- yeah. left alone yeah wilderness area you can go and then camp you can go and fish as long as you're under foot or horseback but it's still monitored and kind of maintained by a government level. They're still looking at it to make sure that... Yeah, there's probably some trail maintenance and this and that. that and maybe that, some fire management, but that's about no, it. No. Oh, they don't do the fire management? Just trail management. That's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah. Nope. Yep. Incredible to have those vast, vast areas. Oh, just, I mean, as far as you can see, I mean, I'm only five miles uh, from... There's, there's hunting that takes place in there? Mm-hmm. You yeah. can hunt. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We'll, we'll, you guys come back next fall. We'll go. We'll go up for the the high mountain at Bluegrass. Oh, when you, when you come back in the summer, you ought to take go in there, take the tent, and go in there five miles and fish those. There's hundred. There's right up here. There's called the Lake Plateau, and there's I don't know, 150 lakes up there in that one area. Incredible, Ben. It, it's been the most fascinating discussion. Um, I. You know, my, my brain is frazzling from all the information that you've given us and what an incredible life story and uh, achievement in writing and involvement in passing legislation. Uh, you, you've clearly left uh, an impact and a legacy, and that's incredible. Well, thank you. I, I think my writing, and like I say, I, it's really kind of... 30 years ago, I never thought I could write. You know, I just... And I was always been a... A photo journalist, you know, and that's and it's it's really interesting because the fact that usually and for writing for mag for magazines, you're usually usually either a photographer or a writer. A writer photographer is very rare. I mean, here's one now, and the, and there was more come when I first started. That people were amazed that I could write in 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 or photograph first and basically that's how I got into writing my my publishers or people I was photographing magazines would say Ben you know all this stuff why don't you about birds you studied it why don't you write about it 
and I kept saying, oh, I can't write about it. And then, so I started. And, you did. And then I'm not a fast writer. I I, I don't class myself as being an outstanding writer. Just, But I think I'm more of a wordsmith than maybe a, a storyteller. Then. Well, I enjoy your stories. And I think everybody who listens to this is going to enjoy your stories today. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. That's it for another two weeks where I will be bringing you an interview with Dr. Rebecca Wade looking at river system conservation and ecosystem services, as well as looking at the role of women in science. So it's a really fascinating interview that I recorded at Abertay University just up the road, actually, from where this office is. We'd really love it if you enjoy this podcast, if you could go and leave us a review and a rating on whatever podcast platform you listen to this show on. And if you've got any suggestions or you'd just like to contact and say hi or let us know podcasts from the past or present, which you've particularly enjoyed, we'd love to hear from you. Contact us on the various social platforms we use or feel free to email. I love receiving emails. Podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. 